welcome back to Tales from Africa. After our extended break, I've got a rather extended series uh, starting off this week with the preface and uh, back- background of Jock of the Bushfelt by Sir Percy Fitzpatrick. Now, the copy I, I have here with me um, is an earlier copy uh, d- dating to around 1948. Now, because of this, some some of the language used uh, is racially insensitive. So, a warning um, beforehand. Uh, Fitzpatrick's uh, daughter um, cha- changed uh, those words without changing the essence or nature of the tale uh, later on. But for now... Uh, and then uh, now the, those words are still included, and as this is the only copy I have, um, it being passed down through the generations, um, this is what we are stuck with. Um, however, it should be noted that uh, not an entirely large amount of blame can be put on Fitzpatrick, um, and one really shouldn't equate him with, with say, Nazis or or white supremacists, or the rest of it. Uh, rather, his views were just and those of uh, the time, but weren't, as far as I know, extreme and out of the ordinary in uh, cruelty or extremities. Uh, thus, without further ado, the preface and uh, background to Jock of the Bush Fount uh, edition 1948. First, the dedication. It was the youngest of the high authorities who gravely informed the inquiring stranger that Jock belongs to the little people. That being so, it is clearly the duty, no less than the privilege of the mere narrator, to dedicate the story of Jock to those keenest and kindest of critics, best of friends, and most delightful comrades, the little people. The preface. Sonny, you keen reckon dead sure there's sung wrong about a thing that don't explain itself. That was old Rocky's advice, given three and twenty years ago, not forgotten yet, but in this instance respectfully ignored. It happened some years ago, and this was the way of it. The fox of Belly Bortherin, having served the three generations in his native Tipperary, in Caffereria, and in the Transvaal, seemed entitled to, to a rest. And when, in the half hour before lights out, which is the little, little people's particular own, the demand came from certain autocrats of the nightgown. Now, tell us something else. It occurred to the puzzled one to tell of Jock's fight with the table leg, and that is how the trouble began. Those with experience will know what followed, and for those less fortunate, the modest demand of one comfortably tucked up other tailor-wise, and emphasising his points by excited handshakes of his toes will convey the idea. It must be all true, and don't leave out anything. To such an audience, a story must be told a hundred times, but it must be told, as Kipling says, just so. That is, in the same way, because even a romance, what a three-year-old once excused as only a play tale, must be true to itself. Once Jock had taken the field, there was no long, not long before the narrator found himself helped or driven over the pauses by quick suggestions from the gallery. But there were days of fag and f- worry when thoughts lagged or strayed and when slips were made and then a vigilant and pitiless memory swooped like the striking falcon of its prey. Then there came a night when the story was of the old crocodile, and one in the gallery, one of more exuberant fancy, seeing the gate open, ran into the flower-strewn field of romance by su- and by sub- suggestive questions and eager prompting, helped to gather a little posy. And he caught the crocodile by the tail, didn't he? And he hung on and fought him, didn't he? And the old crocodile flung him high into the air, high, and turning to the two juniors, added, quite as high as the house. And the narrator, necessary by reason of a mechanical nod and an absent-minded, yes, passed on, thinking it could all be but uh, be put right next time. But there is no escape from the tangled web from when the little people sit in judgment. It was months later when retribution came. The critical point of the story was safely passed when, 
Oh, the irony and poetic justice of it. It was the innocent tempter himself who laid his hand in solemn protest on the narrator's shoulder, and, looking him reproaching full, reproachfully in the eyes, said, Dad, you have left out the best part of all. Don't you remember how? And the description which followed only emphasizes the present writer's unfitness for the task he has undertaken. In the text of the story, there is left a loophole for fancy. It is open to any one to believe that Jock is just a beginning or just ending his aero excursion. The important people were not satisfied, but then the page is not big enough to exhibit Jock at the top of that flight of fancy. From the date of that lesson, it was apparent that re reputations would suffer if the story of Jock were not sp speedily embodied in some durable and authoritative form, and during a long spell of ill health, many of the incidents were retold in the form of letters to the little people. Other less important persons, grown-ups, read them and sometimes heard them, and so it came about the story of Jock was to be printed for private circulation for the little people and their friends. Then the story was read in manuscript, and there came still more ambitious counsels, some urging the human story of the early days, others the wild life of South Africa. Conscious of many de deficiencies, the narrator has, less, has left the two great fields practically untouched, adhering to the original idea, the story of Jock. And those who come into it, men and animals, come in because of him and the life in which he played it so large a part. The attempt to adapt the original letters to the symmetry of a connected story involved, as one might have known, endless troubles and changes, necessitating complete rewriting of most parts. The writer is well aware that, from the above causes and one another, there are grave inequalities in style and system, and in plain of phrase and thought in different parts of the book, for well, this feature, the one other, causes alone put forward as a defence. The story belongs to the little people, and their requirements were defined. It must be all true. Don't leave anything out. It has been necessary to leave out a great deal, but the other condition has been fully and fairly complied with. For it is a true story from beginning to end. It is not a diary. Incidents have been grouped and moved to get over the difficulty of blank days and bad spells, but there is no incidents, incident of importance or of credit to Jock which is not absolutely true. The severest trial in this connection was in the last chapter, which is bound to recall perhaps the most famous and most cherished of all dog stories. Much indeed would have been sacrificed to avoid that, but it was unthinkable that, for any reason, one should in the last words shatter the spell that holds Jock dear to those for whom his life is chronicled, the spell that lies in a true story. Little by little the book has grown until it has come perilously, perilously near the condition in which it might be thought to have pretensions. It has none. It is what it was, a simple record, compiled for the interest and satisfaction of some little people, and a small contribution of remembrance and affection offered at the shrine of the old life and those who made it, tended in the hope that some one better equipped with opportunities and leisure may be inspired to do justice to it and to them for the sake of our native land. Now with the preface over, we go on to the background. Of the people who live lonely lives on the Vald or elsewhere, few do so of their own free choice. Some they are shut off from all their kind, souls sheathed in some film invisible, through which no thrills of sympathy may pass. Some barred by their self-consciousness, heart-hungry still, who never learned in childhood to make friends. Some have a secret or a grief, some thoughts too big or bad for comradeship. But most will challenge to fate the thoughtless choice, the chance, or the hard necessity that drew or drove them to the life apart. They know the lesson that was learned of old. It is not good for man to be alone. Go out among them, ever moving on, whose white bones mark the way for others' feet, who strun the cities living in the wilds and move in silence, self-contained. Who knows what they think, or dream, or hope, or suffer? Who can know? For speech among that hard-skilled lot is but a half-remembered art. Yet something you may guess since what with the man there often goes, his dog, his silent tribute to the book. Oh, it's little they know of life who cannot guess the secret springs of loneliness and love that prompt the keepings of a trifling pet, who do not know what moves a man who daily takes his chances of life and death, man whose breath is in his nostrils 
to lay his cheek against the muzzle of his comrade, comrade dog, and in the trackless miles of wilderness feel he has a friend. Something to hold to, something to protect. It was old Blake, mad, quite mad, as everybody knew, of whom they vaguely said that horses, hounds, coaches, covers, and all that goes with old estates were as once. We knew him poor and middle-aged, how hold to us, cherry and unpractical, with two old pointers and a fowling piece, and a heart as warm as toast. We did not ask each other's business there, and judging by the dogs and gun, and gum, we put him down as a remittance man, but that, it seems, was wrong. They were all his. He left no litters, a little pile of paper ash, no money and no food. That was his pride. He would not sell or give away his dogs. That was his love. When he could not keep them, it seemed time to go. That was his madness. But before he went, remembering a friend in the hospital, he borrowed two cartridges and brought him a bra- an embrace of birds. That was old man Blake, who moved on and took his dogs with him. Because they had always been together and he could not leave their fate to chance, so he buried him with one on either side, just as he would have liked it. There was Turnham, who shot the crocodile that seized his dog and reckless of the others, swam in and brought the dog to land. There was the dog that jumped in when his master slipped from the rock and swimming beside him was snapped down in his head. And there was a boy who tried a rescue in the dark when a rustle, yelp and growl told that the lions had his dog and was never seen again. So it goes and so it went from year to year, a little showing now and then, like the iceberg's tip from which to guess the bulk below. There was a boy who went to seek his fortune, call him boy or man. The years proved nothing either way. Some will be boyish always, others never young. A few, most richly dowered few, are man and boy together. He went to seek his fortune, as boys will and should, no pressure on him from about, no promise from beyond. For life was easy there, and all was pleasant as it may be in a cage. Today is sure and happy, and there is no tomorrow in a cage. They were friends, enough, all kind and true, and in their wisdom they said, Here to safe, yonder all is chance, where many indeed are called, but few, so few are chosen. Many have gone forth, some to return, beaten, hopeless and despised, some to fall in sight outside, others are lost, we know not where, and ah, so few are free and well. But the fate of numbers is unheeded still, for the few are those who count and lead, and those who follow do not think. How few but cry, how strong, how free, be wise, and do not venture. Here it is safe, there is no fortune there. But there was something stronger than the things he knew, around, with, about, and beyond, the thing that strove him within him, that grew and grew, and beat and fought for freedom, that bade him go and walk alone and tell a secret on the mountain slopes to one who would not laugh, a little red retriever, that made him climb and feel his strength, and find out an outlet for what drove within, and thus the end was sure, for of all the voices none so strong as this, and only those others reached him that would chime with it, the gentle, the gentle ones which said, we too believe, and one, a stronger one, saying, fifty years ago I did it, I would do it now again. So the boy set out to seek his fortune, and did not find it, for there was none in the place where he sought. Those who warned him were, in the little, right, yet he, in the greater, right too. It was not given to him yet to know that fortune is not in time or place or things, but good or bad in the man's own self for him alone to find and prove. Time and place and things had failed him, still was effort right, and when the first was clear beyond all question, it was instinct, not knowledge, bade him still go on, saying, not back to the cage, anything but that. When many days had passed, it was again a friend who met him, saying, Common sense is not cowardice. You have made a mistake. Repair it while you can. It have, I have seen and know. There's nothing here. Come back with me, and, I will, and all will be made easy. And answer and reason there was none, for the little truth was all too plain, and the greater not yet seen. But that which had swelled to bursting and had fought within for freedom caught out. Failure is the worst of all, and the blind and struggling instinct rose against all knowledge and all reasons. Not go back to the cage, not that. And the heart that had once been young spoke up for old lads sing. And the old eyes softened and dropped 
God speed you, boy, goodbye. And as the mail coach sped, rumbled off, the boy put up his head to try again. The days passed and still there was no work to do. For those who were there already, hardened men and strong, pioneers who had roughed it, were themselves in Stratonese case, and it was no place for boys. So the boy moved on again, and with him a man in equal plight, but being a man, a guide and comfort to the boy, and one to lead him on the way. Hungry they walked all day, yet when the sun went down and light began to fail, the place where work and food and sleep should be was still far off. The mountain tracks were rough and all unknown, the rivers many, cold and swift, the country wild, none lived, few ever passed that way. When night closed in, the boy walked on in front, and the man league lagged heavy, wearily, grumbling at their luck. In the valley at the mountain foot they came at midnight upon water, black and still, between them and the cabin's light be lights beyond, and there the man lay down. Then the boy, turning in his anger, bade him come on, and dragging him out upon the further bank had found, unknowing, some little of the fortune he had come to seek. Still, morning brought no change, still was there no work to do, so the man gave up, and sagging back was lost, and the boy went on alone. Rough and straight-spoken, but kindly men and true were those who came among. The, what they could, they did, and what they had, they gave. They, ma they made him free of board and bed, and kinder still, now and then made work for him to do, knowing his spirit was as theirs, and that his heart cried out, Not charity, but work, give me work, but that they could not do, for there was no work they could not do themselves. Thus the days and weeks went by, willing but unused to fend for himself, unfit by training for the wild, rough life, heart and energy all to waste, the little he did know, now of no value there. The struggles with the ebbing tide went on. It was the wearing, hopeless fight against that which cannot grapple and cannot even see. There was no work to be done. A few days later and there, a little passing job, a helping hand disguised, and then the quest again. They were all friendly, but with the kindly habit of the place, it told the hail of hopelessness too well. They not even ask his name. It made not a difference. Then came a day when there was nowhere else to try. Among the, among the lounging diggers at their week's end deals, he stood apart, too shy, too proud to tell the truth, too conscious of it to trust his voice, too hungry to smile as if he did not care. And then a man in muddy moleskins with grey face, brown beard and soft blue eyes came over to him, saying straight, Boy, you come along with me. And he went. It was work. Hard work, but the joy of it, shoveling in the ice water and mud and gravel and among the boulders from early dawn to dark. What matter? It was work. It was not for hire, but just to help one who had helped him to earn his grub and feel he was a man. Doing the work of his friend's partner, he was away. For three weeks the boy went worked on, grateful for the toil, grateful for the knowledge gained, most grateful that he could by work repay a kindness. And then the truth came out. The kindly fiction fell away as they sat and rested on the day of rest. The claim could not stand two white men's grub had fallen from the man, accounting for his partner's absence. It was the simple and unstudied truth and calm unconsciousness of where it struck that gave the thrust its thought force. And in the clear, still air of the Sunday morning, the boy turned hot and cold and dizzy to think of his folly and of the kindness he had so long imposed on. It was a little spell before his lips would smile and eyes and voice were firm enough to lie. Then he said gently, If he could be spared, he had not liked to ask before, but now the floods were over and the river turned perhaps it could be managed. He would like to go, as there were letters waiting and he expected news. Up the winding pathway over rocky ledge and grassy slope, climbing for an hour to the pass, the toil and effort kept the hot thoughts under, at the top, the boys sat down to rest. The green rock crested mountains stood like resting giants all around. The rivers, silvered by the sun, threaded their way between. The air was clear and cool and still, and the world was very beautiful from there. Far, far below, a brownish speck beside the silver streak stood the cabin he had left, and without warning, all came back on him. What he had mastered rose beyond control. The little child that lies hidden in all of us reached out, as in the dark, for a hand to hold, and there was none. 
His arms went up to the hide, the mocking glory of the day, and face buried in the grass, he sobbed, not worth my food. Science tells that nature will recoup herself by ways as well defined as those that rule mechanics. The blood flows upwards, and the brain's a whirl. The ebb tides sit, and there is rest. Whatever impulse sways the guiding hand, we know that often when we need it and most, and there comes relief. Gently unbidden, unobsor- unobserved. The boy slept, and there was peace a while. Then came faint echoes of the waking thoughts, odd words and shot out, of hopes and resolution, memoured names of those at home. Once he, his hand went out and gently touched the turf, reaching for the friend and comrade of the past. One who knew his every mood and heard his wildest dreams described had seen him, hot-eyed, breathless, struggling to escape the cage. One to whom the boyish soul was often barred in youth in, in foolish confidence. One who could see and hear and feel yet never tell. A little red retriever left at home, and the boy stood and sighed for answer to the soft brown eyes. No, it is not good for a man to be alone. A wisp of drifting cloud came by, a breath of cooler air, and the fickle spirit of the mountain changed the day as with a wand. The boy woke up shivering, dazed, bewild. The mountain of his dreams had vanished, and his dog was not there. The cold, driving mist had blotted out the world. Stronger and stronger grew the wind, driving the damp cold through and through. For on the bleak plateau, plateau of the mountain nothing broke its force. Pale and shaken and a little stiff, he looked about and slowly faced the storm. It did not struck him to turn back. The gusts blew stronger and through the mist came rain, and single stinging drops portents of the greater storm. Slowly as he bent to breast it, the chilled blood warmed him, and when the first thunderclap split overhead and lost itself in endless roars and rumblings in the cliffs and the hills around, there came a warmth about his heart and a light into his eye. Mute thanksgiving that here was something he could battle with and be a man again. On the top of the world the storms work all their fury. Only there came come mist and wind and rain, thunder and lightning and hail together. The pitiless terrible howl there where the hare hiding in the grass may know it, it is in the highest thing in all God's world. And nearest to the storm. The one clear mark to draw the lightning and all knowing scurries to the sheltered slopes. But the boy pressed on. The little path a racing stream to guide him. Then in the one group of ghostly mist, mist blurred rocks he stooped to to drink. As he bent for all the blackness of the storm, he, his face leaped out at him. Reflected for one instant in the shallow pool, the blue white flame of lightning. And blinding his aching eyes, hissed down the sickening smell of brimstone and spread about, and crashing thunder close above his head left him dazed and breathless. Heedless of the rain, blinking the blackness from his eyes, he sat still for head to clear and the limbs to feel their life again, and as he waited, slowly there came upon it the coldest, stiller air, that other roar, so far, so dull, so uniform, so weird and terrifying, the voice of coming hail. Huddled beneath the shelving rock, he watched the storm sweep by with awful, battering din that swamped in silence every other sound, the tearing, smashing howl that seemed to stripe the mountain to its very bone. Oh, the wanton fury of the hail, their wild, destructive charge of hordes of savage cavalry, the stamping, smashing sweep along the narrow strip where all the fury concentrates, the long black trail of death and desolation, the birds and beasts, the things that creep and fly, all know the portents and all flee before it or aside. But in the darkness, in the night or mist, the slow, the weak, the helpless, and the mothers of the young, for them is little hope. The dense, packed columns swept along, Ruthless, raging and unheeding, overwhelming all, a sudden failing of its strength, a little straggling tail, and then the silence. The sun came about, the window down, light veils of mist came slowly by, bits of floating gossamer, and melted in the clear, pure air. The boy stepped out once more. Miles away, the black column of the failing hail sped its appointed course, 
Under his feet, where all had been so green and beautiful, was battered turfs, for the time transformed into a maze of dazzling brilliance where jagged eye stones caught the sunlight on their countless facets and threw it back in one fierce, flashing glare, blinding in its brilliance. On the glittering surface many things stood out. In the narrow pathway near the spring a snake lay on its back, crushed and broken. Beyond it a tortoise, not yet dead, but buried and battered through its shell, then a partridge, poor, unprotected thing, the wet feathers lying all around, stripped as though a hawk had stricken it, and closed behind it all the little brood. And further afield lay something reddish-brown, a buck, the large eyes and ooze of blood upon its lip and lips and nose. He stopped, stooped to touch it, but drew back. The dainty little thing was pulp. All striving for the sheltering rocks, all caught and stricken by the ruthless storm, and he was going on to face it where others fled before. He, blindly fighting on, was spared. Was it luck, or was there something subtle more? He held to this, that more than chance had swayed the guiding hand of fate, that fortune holds some gifts in store for those who try, and faith resurgent moved him to mute durum of which no more reach the conscious brain than it is good to be alive, but better so than in the cage. Once more, a little of the fortune that he had come to seek. At sunset, passing down the long, rough gorge, he came upon one battling with the flood to save us all. The white man struggling with the frightened beast, the kaffir swept from off his feet, the mare bewild orcs, oxen leading were yielding to the stream and heading downwards towards the falls in the utmost need the boy swam in and helped and there the long slow ebb was stayed the boy was worth his food but how recall the life when those who made it set so little store by all that passed and took its ventures for their daily lot when those who knew it had no gift or thought to fix the colours of the fading past the fire of youth the hopes the toil the brightness bright illusions gone and now the story of a dog to conjure up a face, a name, a voice, or the grip of a friendly hand, and the, the half dream sound of the tramping feet is all that is left of the live procession long since past. The young recruits, the laggards, the faint, the few who saw it through, the older men, grave-eyed, thoughtful, unafraid, who judged the future by the battered past, and who knew none more nor less than man, unconscious equals of the best and least, the grey hued years, the thinning ranks, the summons answered as they had lived, alone, the tale untold, and of all who knew it, none left to picture now the life, none left to play a grateful comrade's part, and place their record on a country's scroll, the kindly, constant, nameless pioneers. Thank you for tuning in for this episode of the back of the the background and uh, introduction to Jock of the Bushveld. Uh, I'll greatly be uh, appreciate to see you all again, and thank you for listening. Goodbye.